Thank you, and hello once again from uh, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. We are on uh, Lake Calhoun, and we've even got uh, Canadian geese coming to make us really look welcome, and uh, certainly we're grateful for the more than 2,000 people who come out here each day during our week's stay in one of the most beautiful, the state of 10,000 lakes. Who wouldn't want to visit Minnesota? More importantly, who wouldn't want to live here? You're all very, very fortunate. Um, I'm pleased to present uh, on this, our second show from uh, Minnesota, one of our favorite people, a man who comes right at you <laughs> with uh, ideas about which he cares very, very deeply. And he's one of those uh, doctors who, when he speaks, you understand what he says. So uh, what more could a person ask for? He's also not just a theorist. He's raised five kids of his own. And so uh, I guess he knows what it's like to go and look for worms with a flashlight. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> You know what I mean. If you're a parent, well, we'll, we'll take it out of the tape. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here's the baby doctor, Lyndon Smith. Dr. Smith. Dr. Lyndon Smith. Hi. Hi. I'm sure everyone wants to know about breastfeeding mothers. And what, the, what do they want to know? The cancer-causing agents in oh, milk. Yeah. I, uh, what I can understand from reading of the literature that uh, although there's some disadvantage, obviously, to what comes through in the milk, why the, the advantages of breastfeeding uh, completely outweigh the disadvantages. And some authorities now feel that the breast milk actually has a detoxifying effect on any uh, bad uh, chemical that might be in there, which wouldn't happen if you got cow's milk. And the cow is probably out in the, you know, outside more. He might be exposed to more things, and he might be worse getting cow's milk. So try to use uh, breast milk. Uh, you're a mother? Yeah, I nurse both. And it, no problems? No, I, I really liked it. Uh, is there a supplementary? I think we're going to have to bring my mic down. Just thank you. Is there a supplementary kind of apparatus now that women are using? Uh, recently, I uh, helped a patient, she did most of the work, who adopted a three-month-old <laughs> child who uh, uh, had a terrible itchy rash, and the child had to rub its head on the sheets and whatnot. It was very miserable, and we tried changes of milk and different things, and nothing worked until the mother, with the help of the Lalechi people, um, uh, got uh, uh, a, d a little device that's lactate, and it's a plastic bag, she straps on her chest. There's a little tube that goes out over the end of her nipple. So the baby sucks on her breast, but the tube is in the baby's mouth. And so the, the baby is rewarded for sucking. It gets some milk instead of just sucking on a dry breast, which is bad news for anybody who's tried that. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is that the, the breast glands, uh, the, the nerves down there, send a message up to the brain and says, there's a baby out there. And the brain says, I didn't know. Why, why didn't the uterus tell me? Well, the uterus it had been empty all this time. But the, so the, the brain says, OK, we'll send some stuff down. So down comes the hormone, stimulates the milk glands. And, the, and after a week or so, why, she's producing milk. But she needed this start to get going. So uh, the, the La Leche people have got this figured out. It's terrific. Within three days, the rash was gone. Three so days, the rash was gone. This is actually just an apparatus that attaches and that uh, yeah, she just the baby is, is in I, the I right thought place. They, I thought they put it in their armpit to keep it warm, and then they go, <laughs> you know, but 
you have it's the sucking so the baby has to suck and uh, right. that is rewarded for sucking you have to reward people for doing things I could just see some guy right out of college coming home after the, to see the baby and his wife is going <laughs> good morning I have a six-year-old daughter and she just started first grade and I was wondering how to avoid letting her become a perfectionist because she gets very worried if she makes any mistakes in her schoolwork hmm uh, that may be, I thought that everybody in Minnesota was like that they're all uh, <laughs> obsessive compulsive Scandinavians I married one and she came from uh, this town uh, it's a very healthy thing to do. They, they plow straight fields and they do nice, neat things and they, and they feel guilty if they're not working and uh, so it's, uh, maybe it's all right. I think uh, your attitude has something to do with it. We're, we're convinced a lot of this is genetic. I knew a little kid that uh, every night he'd hang up his sock over one rung and over the other and tie his shoes, uh, laces up and put them on the chair and his coat was over the back of the chair, and the mother said, please be messy like normal kids, but he couldn't. <laughs> so it, it's, it's all right. I don't think you can change it a lot, except to try to relax her about that sort of thing and pat her on the head and reward her for, uh, for what she does, but maybe not overdo it. It's, uh, I think the, the main thing you have to do is accept her and give her a good self-image for what she is. Are but you? I, but are I don't you think you made her that way. Are you a perfectionist? I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, let me ask you, how soon after you get up is the bed made? <laughs> oh, well, I get up an Sun hour and a half before my husband, so he makes the bed, but I get the kids up for school. I see. <laughs> Do you iron your sheets? No, I don't. <laughs> I'm pretty careful about folding towels, and I keep things pretty right. neat. If I came over to your house and ran my finger across the top of your refrigerator, would you be embarrassed? <gasps> no. <laughs> my husband makes me keep it clean. <laughs> oh. uh, well, maybe it's the old man here. I mean, uh... Yeah, it, it often is. Huh? There, you know, there, there are many different lifestyles compatible with normality, but I think if she's comfortable with that and she has no symptoms, why, that's perfectly all right. Yeah, you know. All right. Yes. I have a nine-month-old son, and since the day he was born, I've always talked to him, told him that I was putting on his socks, that Daddy was coming home and everything. Do you think that's important? Oh, yes, yes. And uh, well, uh, some people say they have to do it, you know, straight English and no baby talk. I don't think it makes too much difference. But this communication is terribly important. Up till about uh, six or seven months, you try to imitate the baby's gurglings. They go, ah, and you go, ah. And then he gets this feedback so that you also n understand about hearing. And you have to be careful because, um, you know, some children are deaf and they don't respond. So it's very important to talk to a child because communication, verbal communication, is what humans do. And we develop a sense of humor through that. We develop speech, and the higher centers of learning are all based on this sort of thing. So you have to do that. I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that shouldn't need to be asked. Everybody should be doing it automatically. Yes. Yes, how can I motivate my child to try something for the first time? He has very little self-confidence. This, uh, I yeah. I can't give him the praise until he tries, and I can't get him to try. Well, if it's a two-year-old and you're trying to get him to ride a two-wheel bike, you may have a little yeah. trouble. How, how, old, how old is your baby? Uh, he's five. It's uh -huh. mostly outdoor team-type activity. He, he's hesitant to get involved in right. group-type stuff. Right. So, uh, some children are really scared about that, and you can't push him into it without, uh, you know, he, he, he might even fear it more. The worst, of course, is the, the uh, disappointed uh, father who didn't become an athlete that has a, a son who's pushing him into sports and the son is flat-footed or just a little klutzy and, and he's out there throwing balls at him. You're going to learn to catch the ball. That's a dirty trick. You have to uh, go one step at a time and the main thing and the, the, the bottom line to all this we're talking about is to give a child a good self-image. If you push a child into an activity in which the child is uncomfortable, then the child will back off. I can remember my mother sending me off to the Y and I went into the, the Y and here were all these, uh, these neat sports types dribbling balls and I I could hardly you know do anything with it I could I could even roll a big basketball and so I went right through the wine went out and got on my bike and rode around to, went home and she said how was the wine I said terrific I I wasn't going to be embarrassed you can't embarrass a child and expect him to have any fun learning involves a lot of fun the child's play is work to them but it's got to be fun so get him into activity you know one step at a time until he finds out what he's comfortable with is there any re relationship between a child running temperature and having allergies from the time they're five months old till about two? Does this create a learning disability as they get older? Or oh, could it cause uh, Yeah, I would think so. That we, we see a lot of children like that. The first thing I would think of is that uh, 
that the child is allergic to something and the allergy predisposes the child to infections. The most common thing, of course, would be milk. Like if you nurse the child of five months and went to cow's milk and then infections and fevers and allergies and plugged nose and ear infections might prevent the child from getting all the, the auditory messages it's supposed to do. And so this might set it back, uh, uh, not retarded, but set the child back because he's not getting the proper stimulation. I think that would be something that should have been investigated and, and taken care of. Uh, Doctor, you in, did you res, were you a resident here or an intern? Uh, an intern, and uh, I at was where? At, you know, I was uh, at General Hospital, da da da, and uh, before they before they fixed it, and um, uh, we were. What? I made uh, I made fifteen dollars a month. It was back in 1946, and uh, I had the ambulance run in the middle of winter, and. Uh, these, these ambulance drivers were ex-pilots and they would scream around the ice and snow, it was incredible. And we had um, uh, food that you couldn't believe, uh, it was hospital food, and as a result of that I had all sorts of intestinal trouble, but uh, <laughs> able to function. We were here 15 months. Our group, uh, see the group before, during the war was here for nine months, and our group was here for 15 months, and so our group had a, a highest rate of uh, marrying nurses than the, the other groups. <laughs> Geography had something to do with that. Did you marry a nurse? Yes, as a matter of fact, and I'm still married to her, and I haven't had a back rub since 30 years. <laughs> but it was her mother's cooking that got, got me interested. In. I, she took me to her home in uh, South Minneapolis, and I, I had uh, dinner there, and the food was so superior to the hospital food, I gave, I gave uh, Mrs. Starheim my days off uh, schedule, so she <laughs> wouldn't have to worry about when to call me. So uh, I think that there's something about uh, is it uh, salt the cow and get the calf? No, that's the other way around. I'm, I'm, I, I'm yes. I have a seven and a half year old son who wets the bed constantly, almost every night. Is uh, there anything? I've tried everything. Uh, question, before you married your husband, did you ask him if he had been a bedwetter? <laughs> no, that wasn't there's one some, of There's the some genetic aspects to this, uh, asked my wife. Um, uh, we, we, it's something like 15% uh, of boys and 8% of girls wet the bed. Uh -huh. Now that two to one ratio has to mean there's some genetics involved with this. It's usually a deep sleeper, and we're finding that uh, although there could be, maybe in one or two percent, uh, some problem with the plumbing or uh, some, you know, physical, really physical thing, uh, the psychiatrists say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a type of aggression that the child is paying the mother back, if you <laughs> want to believe that. It's so I bad. I believe it. The psychiatrists <laughs> make up stuff. But now we're finding that if we uh, don't let them drink milk, sometimes they wet because they drink milk. Sometimes they wet because their blood sugar is low and they're so deeply asleep that when the bladder fills up, the brain doesn't get the message. But also, you might try magnesium. We found that uh, lots of bladders can't stretch beyond three or four ounces because it doesn't have, they, the muscles don't have enough magnesium. Magnesium has a property of relaxing muscles, so they can, they can hold 12 or 13 ounces. Nobody can stay dry all night if they can't hold 12 or 13 ounces. So there are about three things you can do. There's a bedwetting device you can put in the bed, and when they wet, why the bell goes and the light go on. Usually the whole family's around the bed. <laughs> but I had, I, I must tell you, I, uh, the, the people, uh, uh, the, 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 well, one mother, a patient of mine, had she tried everything, nothing worked. So she got an old mattress, cut a hole in it, lined it all with plastic, and had the kids sleep in a t-shirt <laughs> down into a bucket. Well, he about fell down in there one night, so they ended up strapping him to the toilet until he outgrew it, and he got, Sorry. <laughs> does, does that bu the bell, uh, I'd be afraid to use that device. You know, the kid would be 19 years old, and every time a bell goes off, he'd wet himself. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> like Pavlov's dog. But the, 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 what we think about uh, bedwetting, because in the old days, now get this, they used to believe in 1911, and some people still believe it, that any bedwetter grew up to be a criminal. And it was mainly because a mother heard that, and she would say, you wet the bed one more time and you grow up to be a criminal. Kid, okay, I'll grow up to be a criminal. So uh, now we know that the bad self-image, again, the same thing we're talking about, it comes as a result of the bed wetting. And even though the mother and the father are trying to be so nice about, uh, we don't mind if you wet the bed, she, <laughs> that, you know, the child gets the message, he's persona non grata. So we have to somehow try to help him get through the thing by whatever we can. There's a medicine that but works. Her, her exasperation, which is understood and which with which all parents are identified, yeah. doesn't help. It makes it worse, doesn't it? Uh, frequently, and the child gets so upset that he may, that's another stress, and stress can make the whole thing worse. But you've got to change the diet. You've got to try to give him some, like some almonds or 
meat at bedtime so his blood sugar won't drop. That seems to be the primary thing that I found that helps. Right. Thank you. We're in Minneapolis, St. Paul with Dr. Lennon Smith, and we'll be back in a moment. Right by the Lennon Smith is with us in the <laughs> Twin Cities, uh, and you're due when? October 5th. Uh, what I would like to ask is I have a year and a half son at home. Do you have any suggestions what I can do with his time while I'm breastfeeding? Uh, <laughs> you've uh, you've given to your breast. <laughs> Well, it is, it is difficult, but uh, many, many children will uh, want to go back uh, to that when they see somebody else. It's sort of like, you know, dog in the manger, I was here first, and uh, <laughs> what, what, what rights do you have? Uh, it usually works out. I can remember when we brought our last one home, we had five kids lying on the floor drinking out of a bottle. They all kind of wanted to retreat to infancy to see if it was any good. So you may have to, um, you know, put up with some of this uh, sort of strange behavior that, um, of reverting to infancy, and it's really all right. So, if, but if you say, no, you can't do that and just get away, well, then he gets put down, uh, and then he'll fight for it even more. So try to go along with his demands for a while. It's really okay. But also, say, you have to say something to the older one about, this is your baby, and you help me out. And uh, we, we brought a, one of ours came home, and we had, well, a four-year-old was, was home. Uh, and uh, she said, I'll take care of the little kid. And we put, okay. So, uh, uh, so I heard this crying at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I, it was my job uh, to take care of the babies and, at night. And I was such an expert. And uh, <laughs> I went in there, and this four-year-old was holding the baby against her chest. And she was crying. She said, I don't have any milk. And the baby was <laughs> looking around, you know. And so I think, you know, she, she hasn't had any children. She's 28 now, but I, I wonder if she does. And the doctor says, you're going to breastfeed? She said, I tried it once. It didn't work. <laughs> Hi, I have a four-year-old son at home who's really a nice, well-mannered little boy until he turned four. <laughs> I, you know, maybe it's the independence and all. Can you help me understand what's going through his mind now that's making him act more verbal, negative, that sort of thing? Uh, a lot of it really is testing out the magic of words. It's really sort of uh, practicing up for adolescence because, uh, you know, there's a time when they have to do this so you'll be glad to get rid of him when he's 18. <laughs> but. It's if, if you think, now what, what you have to do is to kind of get some other uh, opinions from other people, because they do this with their mother. They, he knows that you're not going to kill him, so he's kind of testing you out. And he'll say, drop dead and, and up yours and, you know, <laughs> out the door and stuff like that. They're terrible. They, the language is, you know, is his poop and all this, you know, scatology. So you have to kind of smile it. and pretend that you it bet. doesn't bother you. It may somehow bother you because he was such a neat kid up to now. But you have to rule out the possibility he may be anemic, he may have pinworms. But if you've got him in school and the teacher says that he's just fine, he's like all the rest of them, then you know that he's okay. But if he's worse in the classroom, and uh, then then there may be you know something else going on. But but put up with a lot of it. And if you but if if you're showing a response, you see you may be rewarding him somehow by paying any sort of attention to it. So you have so to accept if, some of this. So if the if the Monsignor comes over and the kid says poopy, you just say yes, darling. Poopy. You say Monsignor poopy is what yeah. you say. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Yeah. I have twin sons, and I'd like to know how you get over the competitiveness. I mean, it's terrible. One can oh, do. Man. They're going to be 13. Are they identical? Yes, they are. Yeah. I don't think you ever can. I, uh, they, you know, they do uh, split up uh, later on. But um, uh, uh, to a certain extent, they sort of enjoy a little bit of that. But there's always one that's going to win. You know, one, there's always a winner and a loser, and they're, they're going to do it. What uh, you try to do is to get one interested in one uh, type of activity, one and another. One is in uh, racing and one in swimming or something, so there would be less competition. I don't know if you can do that, because they may, they may enjoy this competition, even though they're fighting about it. And it's good training for adulthood. We're always competing as we get older, so it's, it's part of the training. Do they don't hurt each other with it, do they? Mm, yes, they do, okay. <laughs> yes. I would like to ask, uh, children in growing pains, I've heard a lot of people say, yes. oh, it's just growing pains. 
but I want to know if there's any truth to that or do children uh, really have something say wrong with their legs if they're complaining all the time? Uh, yes, the, what we don't want to miss is, of course, rheumatic fever, in which it's sort of a joint thing. But if it's in, it's usually at night after a, a good day and they've been out running, it's sort of a shin splint. It's a muscle cramp, and it's supposed to be that they don't have enough calcium. And the lactic acid accumulation apparently makes the muscle go into spasm. So we give them vitamin D or calcium and or, or both, and it, it stops almost overnight. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing how you can do this. And people don't understand this about calcium. That's kind of the thing I'm into is this nutrition. It's just almost a giveaway for a calcium deficit. Even though they're drinking milk, they may not absorb it. Yes, Dr. Smith, 2020 um, did a program on cesarean sections, and one of the woman that was on said that cesarean babies suffer a 5 to 10 percent lower IQ that it affects them throughout their entire life. Do you know where she got that information? Uh, there, there's mind. some, uh, we, we categorically say any baby that was born prematurely the cord around the neck or a collapsed lung or cesarean birth or breech delivery or foot link breech or any of those things, there's a risk of having some problem. And they have found if they followed up, you know, they take a hundred babies and they find, they compare them with a control group that was just the normal delivery, why they had less trouble. But it really depends on the reason they're doing the cesarean birth. Now, if it was, um, um, there was a trial of labor and the baby, the baby was hurt even before it was born by cesarean, you see, that would have hurt the nervous system. If, um, uh, in general, though, the, the obstetrician feels he has more control over the oxygenation of the baby and so forth, and there's less trauma to the baby's head, obviously, if they're born by cesarean section. So, so in a certain extent, there would be less trouble, but there's a reason for doing the cesarean section. It may be a placenta previa, and the woman had been bleeding for a while. They had to do an emergency. It might have been an abruptio placenta where the, uter the placenta sloughs off from the, from the uterine wall, and that's a big emergency. So, you know, there could be a lot of things. But you never know. You can't look at ed ed all these hundred kids and say this one and this one. Right. But, but she should not worry, thing. should she? You can't worry. No, no. Yes, uh, I've got a five-year-old son, and he's obsessed with dogs. Everybody he plays with, they're his dog. He goes to school. They play his dog, too. What can I do about it? <laughs> <coughs> he may grow up to write the famous dog story that gets on television or something. You, you, you don't fight it. You kind of go along with it. And then, and then next year, it'll be some other obsession. They, finally find, they, you, they have usually found the children that have these you know, the long obsessions, everything has to be this way. Ours was, one of ours was a Greyhound bus. Everything was Greyhound buses. And, and what, what some people have done is they will have them um, uh, tape record their stories about dogs or anything. Then you have somebody type it up, and you put a little loose leaf thing, and then, then you make sort of a thing of it. And then he sells this. <laughs> put him to work, heavens, you know, you know. You don't let that slip by. We're in the Twin Cities, uh, and we'll be back with Dr. Landon Smith in a moment. Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, with uh, Dr. Landon Smith, who uh, whose residency was here at um, Minneapolis General. Internship, yes. Internship. Um, before we get to these folks, and as, just as briefly as possible, Dr. Smith, your views about health and uh, have changed considerably since you graduated from medical school. Uh, can you detail for us, as briefly as you can, how they changed and why? I would say that uh, some years ago when I was treating hyperactive children, I found out that many of them were fit a mold, and uh, most of them were sensitive people who came from sensitive families who had a high rate of uh, diabetes, alcoholism, and obesity, and that had to mean some genetic factors there, and those, those were related to carbohydrate things, and these children were sensitive and they were scarfing down carbohydrates. I changed their diet and they got better, so I figured that maybe a lot of sickness is due to things we eat. So I became interested and began to read other literature, not just the stuff that we get in our regular medical journals. And I found out that it was m making some sense. I threw in some vitamins and that made it even work better. Just recently I've been uh, noticing it because I asked the right questions, I think, that I can find a definite correlation between the mother's diet during the pregnancy and the health of the child and the health of the adult that goes clear back 
to when the, the mother was pregnant with that particular child. It's just been fascinating. Doctors are trained to make a diagnosis and treat what they see. They're treating symptoms. They don't treat the patient. We're treating the disease. If you want to get well, you may have to do it yourself. The doctor can, he loves appendicitis, a strep throat, pneumonia, a broken leg, because he can see it. It's great. But uh, if you come in and say, I feel crummy, he says, uh, I don't have a medicine for crumminess. Uh, <laughs> see the psychiatrist. And that's what we're finding. We can keep people from feeling crummy. Right. Uh, so that, is it your view then that the future of well, of, of uh, health care will really key on nutrition more than... I think so, but we have to understand it doesn't work on everything. I, I would, on, on everybody, I have to uh, hedge a lot and say that we need the doctor, we need uh, some common sense, and somewhere between the two. If you go to the doctor and he finds out you have an allergy, why then you know that it's probably your adrenal glands are not working because uh, adrenal gland function has, will suppress allergies. So we know what to do for them. We give vitamin C and vitamin A and B6 and panathenic acid. Your adrenal glands work better and the allergy goes away. It's really that yeah. simple. But it's not that simple because it doesn't work that well on everybody. Do you consume any sugar at all? Oh, yes. And I cheat. And I'm like on the airline, they'll force an eclair down my throat. And I'm, <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll take a couple of B vitamins and I won't get a headache. You see. You have to be kind of sick to see how much better you are. I've only taken aspirin twice this year, where when I was in before, before I did all this, I was taking uh, as aspirin twice a week. So I, my headaches are gone, my allergies are gone. I, I'm so a much nicer person. Ask my wife. Uh, <laughs> ask my you, wife. So you actually feel that consumption of sugar or white flour yes, can it, it, affect you, behavior? Yes, the, the basically the reason that they're, they're so dangerous, sugar and white flour, is that they use up B vitamins. You cannot metabolize. Uh, uh, sh uh, carbohydrates without the appropriate B vitamins. So if you have ever eaten a teaspoon of sugar or ice cream or, or box cereals or any of those things without the right amount of B vitamins, you're behind. And even by eating good food, you can't get your head. Yeah. So you have to take extra things. But some people need more than other people. Okay. We're all different. Do you recommend vitamin B for uh, pregnant women? You bet. And uh, big doses. And I think that the future of our Citizens depends a lot on the pregnant women and what they're eating right now. <clears throat> and if they don't eat properly, then the funny kids they have, we may have to take care of in our old age. And <laughs> those kids are supposed to take care of us. And yeah. uh, uh, Doctor, be the other I way have now. a two-year-old son, and he knows what's going on, but he doesn't want to talk. He, we have a pantomime in our house. It's, it really gets hysterical after a while. Yeah. Is there anything we can encourage? We read. Uh, we yeah, we that's, talk. But you're doing the right talk. thing. Now you're sure he can hear. No problem with hearing. Okay, because it may have to be checked out. Sometimes they don't get all the right levels. He may have no complaints. <laughs> you know the story about the, the kid that didn't say anything until he was five, and, uh, and he says, this GD oatmeal is burned, and the, hey, he talked, and he said, up to now I've had no complaints. <laughs> so uh, okay. it, it'll come as long as you know he can hear him. I have a 10-year-old son, and I thought as your children get older, they would become more modest. Instead, in the last year and a half, he's become a nudist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to, you know, would you put some pajamas on or something? And, you know, maybe he will f that night. He trots around the house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it, has he got anything to be proud of? Is it something? <laughs> maybe something's going on here. It, uh, it usually you have to let's let him do it his own way, but I, I don't, I, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> on this bleacher. Your lifestyle. Uh, uh, Dr. Smith, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and I'm expecting another baby in a few months. And uh, when I had my little girl, I showered her with all kinds of material things, and everybody says, oh, watch it, you're going to have a spoiled brat on your hand, which never did happen because I never used it as, as a substitute for my time in love. What is your theory on a child who has a lot of material things? Do you think that causes a spoiled child? Uh, not necessarily. We do know a single child is more likely to get um, uh, into trouble when they get out in the world and find out that they're not the princess that they, they were before. I think it's in the context of how those things were done. And again, it's the same thing about your good self-image. If you have a good self-image, you can handle just about anything. Lots of stress will go right by because you, you're, you know that you're OK. But if you're unsure about yourself because you weren't accepted as you came in the door by your parents, you're going to have trouble. So I, th I think it's the context of it. Some kids have nothing, no material things, and they get along fine. Others are shard with stuff, and, and uh, 
But usually in that situation, if it's already a shower thing, why the parents are feeling so guilty about being poor parents that they, they're giving them these material things without the love that goes with it. So let us know in 10 years what kind of a jerky kid she is. And <laughs> yes. Yes. Dr. Smith, I have an 11-month-old daughter who sucks her thumb. Can it cause psychological damage to try and break her of it? Yes, uh, d d sh sh d well, not really, but it can, I'll say. But if you really get her to stop sucking your thumb, she'll start fooling with her belly button or clutching her <laughs> bottom, and you don't want that. We've, uh, but what we're finding, and this there's new nutrition thing, that uh, children that have to do rhythmical things, they call them tension relievers, rock the bed, suck the thumb, twist their hair, pull their earlobe, fool with their stomach, and, and then as you get older, you fool with a bra strap or you make your foot go up and down like that. It's almost always something to do with uh, some uh, mineral like calcium or magnesium. Uh, it may be that this child just needs some extra calcium. It doesn't work on everybody, but try a little extra calcium. See if in a week it doesn't go away. It often means that they're doing their own acupuncture, that they're doing this and a message goes up, says, I'm okay, I'm okay. And, um, and so it's like the world is too close. It doesn't have to mean they're insecure. But it, unless you treat her like she is, so try the calcium for fun. See what happens. Very safe. When would you take your baby off the bottle? Uh, when the child threw it at me. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, um, how old is your baby? Six months. And now, I've hit, there have been other, as you know, this is one of those grand uh, areas of conflict among pediatricians, I think. Some say as soon as possible, milk just bloats. It's not good for you. It makes big kind of sort of roly-poly babies that we've <coughs> come to know and love, but that aren't, that aren't really healthy. Uh, that, that's a, there's, you're making good points. Uh, what I'm saying is that the, 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 the milk gets less important after they get teeth six, eight, ten months of age. They need calcium, obviously, but they don't need so much milk. You can get protein out of other things. Uh, and there is such a bad condition like, um, um, you know, a bottle uh, teeth, where the teeth just rot away because they go to bed with a bottle in their mouth and this milk just sits there with the sugar in there and, and it wrecks the teeth. So we try to get people, if the baby needs to suck and seems to have this great desire, then you use water or some non-sugary drink to, that they can suck on if they still need the sucking. So they're, they're all different. Some need to suck longer than others, but if you're going to use the bottles extensively, especially at bedtime after a, a year, uh, why then, uh, with the teeth in there, why certainly just use plain water? Okay. That's when the kid throws the it's bottle. Beautiful you. baby. This is not milk. Thank <laughs> you for being here. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I have an 11-year-old, and when he was very small, he had quite a few allergies. He's now outgrown them, but during that time we spoiled them by watching him because we almost lost him. Now I'm trying to get him independent and he won't go. Yeah, it may take a little while and you may have to kind of hover over him, but you have to keep pushing him out uh, uh, and he has to test himself. Finally when he's comfortable he'll do it, but it has to be a gradual thing. I, I hate this, you know, going swimming and take him on, throw him in the water and learn to swim. That's a dirty trick. It'll, it'll come. Yes. Dr. Smith, I love you. Um, <laughs> I had two C-sections, and I'm just wondering, do doctors really know the effects of the drugs that they give to the mothers? This, this might relate to the woman who asked before about 20% uh, difference in yeah. intelligence. Yeah. I never have heard anything. What, did you have a... Oh, you have to have a general, don't you, yeah. for a C-section? I, uh, I had a spinal the they, first they time used and a to general do a spinal, the second yeah. time. She was they, born within four minutes under general, but yeah. I still feel bad about that. The, the thing that bothers me so much is that it takes like 20 years, another generation of doctors, to get the message that something was wrong. And it usually because it's consumer input that they find, that, oh, we're hurting somebody with what we're doing. My father, a pediatrician, well-respected, uh, thought in those days, in the 20s and 30s, that sudden infant death was due to the large thymus that crushed the windpipe. So they fluoroscoped all babies looking for the thymus. If they did find a big thymus, they gave these babies x-ray doses, and now a few of them have cancer of the thyroid. That was standard medical practice in the 20s and 30s. It's damaging. The same with DES. Now they know there's some relationship to cancer of uh, reproductive organs. All this stuff, uh, they're going to find out all the stuff we're doing now is dumb in 20 years, and those doctors are doing it, think they were doing a good job, and they'll be dead, and so who cares? But you people have to suffer from that. The farther we get away from Mother Nature and what she uh, wanted us to do, the more trouble we're in, and again, it goes back to nutrition. We just can't allow this sort of thing. So straight to the doctor. We have to make the point, though, that... Uh, without sounding like Mr. Pollyanna coming in here. Yeah. Uh, if it was not for the uh, highly oh, sophisticated yeah. C-section technique, a lot of babies wouldn't be with us at all. That's right. And that it doesn't necessarily mean that the, that the cesarean is a 
yeah. is not indicated. But there's got to be a reason why in some hospitals the rate is only 5%, in other hospitals it's up to 50%. There's got to be a difference. Why? What, what's their criterion? Some doctors feel, I'm not going to sit around and wait for this baby to deliver it vaginally, I'm going to just got to open, get it out, and get rid of the, the whole situation. Well, I what would be an indication for, for in well, your... certainly a small pelvis and a big baby. Now, here again, we now understand that in a large percentage of those women that grew up with a small pelvis, it was their mother's diet that produced that small pelvis. We're all meant to have normal babies a normal way. And if we start to fool Mother Nature, we're going to, you know, Mother Nature is trying to tell us in her way, his way, that uh, this is the wrong thing to do. They found this in, in primitive tribes. If uh, they started sugar and white flour, the next generation had a higher incidence of narrowed pelvis in the girls, boys sloping shoulders, knock kneed, flat foot. Yeah. Nutrition would, was just uh, was responsible. Would you do a C-section on a woman who was about to deliver a breech at birth? Uh, I'd, I might give her a trial of labor. I'm, I, I, I would How about placenta that. preview? Can you anticipate that? Uh, usually there's some bleeding with that, and they, they what would now you do. do uh, the, it's, it depends if it's a marginal one or if it's uh, completely occlusive. But in general, the uh, C-section uh, is that's the best one of the best indications is a complete placenta preview. Dr. Smith, I have a nine-month-old baby, and I'm trying to wean her right now, and she still wants her morning and night feedings, and I. I don't know what to do. I don't want to give her a bottle of milk at night. If I don't feed her at night, she'll wake up in the middle of the night, and I have to feed her anyway. Can, can you, you mean you, you're, you're, you're nursing her twice a day? Right. You uh -huh. don't want to give her a bottle. Well, right. that's, that's fine. Can, usually people do that at about that age, and then maybe in a month or so you'll be into one feeding. Uh, usually it's a feeding Which, just before a nap or bedtime, and that's, that's perfectly fine. I would keep that up as, as long as you can can do it. I, I, I think she needs that and, and it's good for you too. Which feeding would you take away first, the morning or evening? I'd do the morning and leave the evening. That's when most of us need a little breast milk. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it tough if she wants to go out though. <laughs> yeah. This is Minneapolis and St. Paul and we're with Dr. Lyndon Smith and we'll be back at Lake Calhoun in just a moment. <laughs> Dr. Landon Smith, Doctor, we've got a, you know, 2,000 questions for you here in only about eight minutes. So let's see how we can do. I know it's tough. Hi, I have a daughter who is 11 now, and when she was about four, she had very unusual surgery, which was gallbladder. She has since suffered with a lot of stomach pain. Uh, do you know why? Uh, it's, it's any surgery is a stress, and sometimes um, people will suffer stomach aches after any sort of um, stressful thing, car accidents and whatnot. We think it may be that the stress could have made her allergic to something she's eating, because stress does uh, sort of exhaust the adrenal glands, if that's the right term. Uh, it, it might be worthwhile changing your diet, trying extra nutrients, and see if that doesn't improve things. The most common thing I would think of is that it, she's got stomach aches because she's drinking milk. It's the most common cause of stomach aches that I find. You might give it a try. My daughter was diagnosed as hyperthyroid earlier this summer. And what you've been saying about sugar, uh, she does eat a lot of sugar. Could that have had something to do with it before she was diagnosed? Yes, we think that a lot of uh, sort of family traits or if there's a genetic um, sort of a tendency to a disease might show up if somebody's body is not working well because they're eating sugar. It really happens. Yes. I've got a two and a half year old little boy. And what do you do for temper tantrums? Oh. Sure, you've heard it before. To, they're but. supposed to have most of the temp times was 15 months, and then they, they get better. At two and a half, they're supposed to be kicking you and uh, you know, just about. Smiling. But uh, you, you try to ignore it. But see if you can. This is the exciting thing I found about the nutrition that they often have temper tensions. You say no if, he's, if it's an empty stomach or he's just eaten some junk. His blood sugar is low because of what he's eaten. So if you feed him and then frustrate him, he won't have a temper tantrum because he feels okay. He can handle the stress of your put down. What, what does he have for breakfast? Cereal, eggs, cornflakes. Okay. 
All right, well, it might be cornflakes that bother him, but the eggs would be good. Yeah, try to, uh, try to feed him uh, more, you know, as feed him every two or three hours. We find this nibbling is worthwhile, and then stress him and see what happens. But that's such a normal thing at that age, I'd hate to lay on some pathology, but you try to turn your back on it. Yes. I have a two-year-old daughter that can pack away more food than my husband and I. Do I just take her out of the high chair screaming or let her eat as much? Is she food? fat? No, she's no. tall, so she's okay. Can hide that, it that's more. part of. Uh, we think a lot of people um, uh, mm -hmm. they're they're they don't absorb things properly, and there's something wrong with the absorption mechanism, and they, so they eat a lot, and they and, and they don't they don't get fat. So you try to feed her every two or three hours. And we're finding that extra B vitamins can help the absorption of the food she's already eating. When I treat hyperactive kids, they're almost always thin and eating a lot of food. And then in uh, two weeks, the mother says, he eats half as much and he's gained weight. Might have something to do with absorption. Over here, Doc. Yes, I'd like to ask you, considering our American diet and the depletion of the soil and, and all those factors, how do you feel about the use of food supplements whether outside of specific problems? Yes, uh, the, the recommended daily allowances of, um, of vitamins, <coughs> it's only like <coughs> 50 milligrams of vitamin C uh, and A and D and all these things are just for survival. I think people should remember that, just for survival. And most of us are being cheated enough and most of us have enough stress and pollution problems from all this that we need extra nutrients. Now, not everybody needs that, but if you have any symptoms at all, you should take extra. So most of us find it's prudent to take some other things, brewer's yeast, wheat germ, eat a little bit of kelp, take some desiccated liver powder. And uh, because the, the government doesn't know, the government uh, just uh, arbitrarily set some of these limits on these things. We all need some extra supplements. You were a hyperkinetic kid, weren't you? I'm sure, but I didn't know it then. I, I, uh, I can remember, you know, I had oatmeal and egg every morning. It did pretty well in school. I was fairly bright. And so, but on Sundays, mother gave us uh, 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 waffles and syrup, and I had headaches in Sunday school. Terrible time. And I thought it was uh, God punishing me for something or other. <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, so there's all grades of this. And, I, right. uh, and, and see, I th one of the problems about dealing with hyperkinesis is that uh, the doctors rarely have it themselves because hyperkinetic behavior usually rules out high, higher education. They don't like college, they don't like med school, but I somehow got through. And so I'm at least sympathetic with some of these uh, people that have Why don't they like college? They're too impatient? They don't want to sit past That's right. Yeah, it's boring. Uh, medical yeah. school is the boringest. We, we sat in the back of the room doing crossword puzzles. It was so bad. So oh. bad. Uh, but you're in such good shape. Do you run or you don't drink, do you? Uh, no, I fall over if I drink. I forget with whom I, I went. I had a date with a girl once, and I, I hope she's not here, because I, <laughs> I, I think I, I never saw her again after this date. And I, I don't remember the date, you know, so I, I don't know what I did to her. <laughs> Why? Because you had a beer or what? I, I had, no, I had, I went at the shower with this fifth of booze when I was a bachelor and, and never, and the next day there I was in my own bed and I never saw her again. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, whoever you are. I, <laughs> Do you jog or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, I, I run uphill. What I've, I've been doing this month, I try something new every month. And this month I take five Brewer's yeast tablets uh, about a half an hour before lunch and run up and I can run to the third telephone pole up the street uh, to my house and then to come in and fall on my face. <coughs> I'm in such great, you wouldn't believe I'm 96 years old. No. What, what the vitamins do you take? I take uh, a thousand of C, I take a big B that has 50 or 75 milligrams each, I take 400 of E, yeah. I take um, uh, uh, and some sort of all-purpose mineral, and I take some, uh, I'm taking, recently this month I'm also taking some extra kelp, and it, uh, when you urinate, it's, you're like it's you're at the ocean. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> really? Uh, how old are you? 96. No, I'm, I'm, I'm 57. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Too old. that hard, huh? Doctor, how do we know uh, what we're lacking in our diet in terms of uh, vitamins and minerals? Is there a test? Oh, uh, no, good, good point, and good question. Often there's a little guesswork that goes with this. If it, like, in general, if it's energy, it's uh, B vitamins. If it's colds and allergies, it's you need vitamin C. If it's uh, skin trouble, it's vitamin A and possibly zinc. We think adolescents have trouble with their uh, acne because in 80% it's something to do with the zinc lack. And I've asked dermatologists, uh, do you use zinc for uh, acne? And they say, we tried, it doesn't work. 
they have to do the whole program. That's, that's the sugar and the white flour and all the junk and, and all the additives. And then uh, they have to nibble on fruits and vegetables. And then they take all these vitamins. And then they add zinc. And then it'll work. It's, yeah. it, it really does. So the, well, there, but there's a hair test that is not very reliable, but it gives trends. And interestingly enough, we've uh, hyperactive kids are frequently low in calcium. Now, they're scarfing down all this milk. Now, the dairy people are so smart, and they tell us you've got to get uh, milk for your calcium. Why aren't these kids' calcium levels any better? We give them dolomite or bone meal. They settle down, their calcium levels come up. I think they're not absorbing the milk that they get. Raw milk may be okay, but homogenized pasteurite is not milk. It's a white fluid, and people should not be uh, d d believe that they're getting uh, something from the cow. We're it's just not about out of time. What if, uh, is there anything that will correct a diminished interest in sex? Uh, uh, sex itself, you know, it's like eating, you lose your appetite. Oh. <laughs> Bef before we break here, I want to acknowledge the presence of a guest uh, on our show several times, one of America's most popular authors. Wayne Dyer is here. Wayne? Hey. <laughs> He's here with his jacket. <coughs> also, here, also here is the person who made you great. Dr. Yes, Smith, yes. Where is your she? Where wife, is she? Julie. Would you stand, Miss Smith? There you are. Hi. <laughs> and we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> We're back, and we're out of time. Just let me, just let me get to Julie over here. Listen, you must have done something right. How long are you married now? 30 years. 30 years. Congratulations. It's so good to see you again. The kids are all right? Did he help you? Yes, he did. He did. He changed diapers, and, uh, yes. you know, doctors are busy. They work all night. You know, yes, he gave, uh, when he was home, he was ours, and he was with the kids. And oh, he you was are? Very, very he was concerned yours. about it. I can well, sometimes think that he uh, hired uh, um, uh, some, uh, extra help around the house in order that uh, we could spend more time together as a family, which I appreciated. Yeah. Well, you, you have a triumphant re-entry into Minneapolis. I thank you both. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> again, <laughs> Dr. Smith. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. On the next Donahue, the kind of woman everybody would love to have next door, syndicated columnist Irma Bombeck joins us in Minneapolis to explain how she plans to survive the next 50 years of marriage, motherhood, and housework. Join us. Well, in Minneapolis, accommodations for the Donahue staff and guests have been provided by the Minneapolis St. Paul Registry, offering both ultra-modern luxury and old-fashioned hospitality. Services provided and promotional fees paid by the new Ford Fairmont Wagon. Built for today, but designed for the years ahead. The Ford in your future. Test drive it now. Fairmont, the newest, better idea from the Wagon Master. Some guests of the Donahue Show receive a gift certificate for True Value Hardware stores who combine value and personal service in over 5,000 locations nationwide.